Well, good morning, my friends. Joy here. Today, 46 years ago, Jerry and I got married. It was second marriage for both of us. We each had a little girl. His little girl was two. My little girl was four. And they bonded super, super quickly. And we had a really, really good life with our two girls for a long time. Till um, they got grown up and married and remarried and things like that. But anyway, yeah, 46 years today. So I'm taking the day off from sewing. Not that I like to do that, but it is our anniversary. And you know, I told you about Jerry's bulldozer seat with ants in it. And he took it to Sherman. Sherman's 45 miles from here. It's in Texas. And that's where Joanne is. And that's where Hobby Lobby is. And that's where real restaurants are. So he has to go there because he found an upholsterer there. And he took his bulldozer seat to that upholsterer last week. Well, since then, he found out that something needs to be filed off or changed or... I don't know. Anyway... <laughs> We have to go to Sherman. He has to go. So I said, well, it's our anniversary. I want to go with you. So, it just so happens that Joanne's having a sale on some pattern. It's either one brand or all the brands or something. Somebody told me that Whitney went and they had every brand of patterns on sale. I have never, ever, ever seen that happen. So, and of course, I don't need any patterns. But last time I went, they didn't even have the new books in yet. They have to have the spring books now. And I bet what we're going to be looking at today is their winter books. Oh well, maybe I won't even buy any. Hey, who wants to place a bet on that happening? <laughs> Before we get into today's devotional, let's go back to yesterday's devotional. Last day of January, it caused no small stir. It was called Real Love. And I was talking about how my girlfriend came over and was telling me about this one person and how if there wasn't any way in the whole wide world this person could ever change and ever be safe, she wished that this person would die. And I said, oh my God, I have thought the same exact thing. I just said the same thing to Jerry recently. And so somebody named Butterfly, hello Butterfly, I doubt you're here anymore, but if you are, um, thank you for stopping by again. And she I don't know if she misunderstood me or she just expanded on what I said, but according to her, I just I thought that anybody that disagreed with me should just die. I didn't say that. I don't think that. I don't feel that way. That is way, way, way. This is what happens with my family. I'll say something and they will blow it completely out of the realm of reality to something I never meant and I never said. <laughs> so don't don't put words in my mouth and thoughts in my head. I love you. I love all of you. I love all people. But there are people in this world who are completely, completely void of goodness. They are full of the devil. The actual devil. And they hurt people. And I was thinking about it. I thought about it all afternoon. Because when you guys disagree with me, when anybody disagrees with me, I always think about it. And I think about it. And I think, well, are they right? Are they right? Is that true or is that not true? Or, or what can I say that, that won't make them even matter? And so I got to thinking about it. And this person said, well, you just think anybody that disagrees with you should die. No, 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 but I'll tell you who I do wish would die. And it's more than one person. I have to correct myself. Yesterday I said, well, it's just that one person. No, it isn't. I'll tell you who I wish would die. It's people like that Epstein guy who I understand isn't really dead. And the people who work with him and the elected officials and the famous people that go there and use his service, his service is to kidnap young girls and young boys and to sell them to be used by adults who want to rape them over and over and over. Many of them have died. So many things going on right there in that realm, you have no clue. But I cannot stand to see a child suffer under the hands of a monster. And yes, 
I would say, what if it was your child and you saw some grown man raping your child and your child is eight or nine years old? I used to work for a doctor. He was a urologist and he was a surgeon. And he, right next door to his office, was a plastic surgeon and they used to work together repairing the damage done on little children, a two-year-old little girl. My job, he took slides. He had all of these books of slides of all of his different surgeries that he used because he was also a professor and he taught other people how to do what he did as a doctor and a surgeon. And so he took these slides. And my job was to arrange these slides in order by date, etc., etc. And he was showing me one one day and telling me about this two-year-old girl, two girl that he had operated on. And she had been raped by, I don't know who it was, but, oh, the damage done to that beautiful, precious baby girl. Do you think I don't wish that man was dead? I wish that man was castrated. I wish he had done to him what was done to that little girl. And yes, I wish God would kill him. And people like that. People who harm children. I have heard, I have read that these young um, children, 12, 13, uh, that go into Hollywood are forced to have things like that done to them. And one kid, I don't, I don't know movie star's names, but one kid wrote a book or told everybody what happened and what happened to him had actually destroyed his rectum. It gave him permanent damage that could not be fixed by a doctor. And this child was 12 and 13 when it was being passed around. This stuff just sickens me. I get on to God and I say, God, I don't understand. Where are these children's angels? Where are their angels? Why aren't they helping them? Why aren't they protecting them? Why aren't they killing those horrible people that are hurting them? So that's my heart. My heart isn't against you or anybody that disagrees with me. But if you are a monster harming children, yes, I wish you were dead. So I hope I have clarified that. <laughs> and of course, I have no control over who dies and who doesn't. Hello, I know that. But I told you about the example in the Bible, and that wasn't the first time. God rained down hailstones on people and killed them. God turned a woman into salt. I mean, God could do it if he wanted to, but you know what? He expects us to take care of things like that now, and we are doing a really lousy job of it. Okay, so let's stop that conversation. I really didn't want to talk about it, but I thought it was necessary. So let's get into today's devotional which is February 1, 2021, and it's called God's Total Control. The scriptures, Matthew 10, 29, are not two sparrows sold for a penny, yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. Matthew 10, 29. Uh, just a little thing I'd like to say. I understand that they're praying in the White House now. And when they get done with the prayer, they're saying, a man and a woman. Did you ever, ever hear Jesus pray to his mother? Did you ever hear him call God mother? He always called him father. Always. Just wanted to say that. Okay, let's see what the lady said, and we'll shut up on joy. Sparrows are nothing special. They are common, ordinary birds that can be found pretty much everywhere. But even common sparrows are special to God. The message of Jesus' words here is that God knows what is happening in every bit of his creation. Even little sparrows matter to him. If a plain, unspectacular bird can't fall from the sky without God deciding on that action, then you can believe that he is in control of everything in your life, too. Okay? And yes, I do believe that God is in total control, and I believe he isn't done yet. And some of you keep saying, well, why do you think God's going to do things the way you want them done? I don't. I think God's going to do things according to his word, his holy 
written word, the Bible. That's what I think God's in total control of. Okay? But I want to tell you a sparrow story. You want to hear my sparrow story? I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. And we had a great big, we only had one tree in our front yard, but it was huge. Its trunk was huge, huge, huge. And the branches went out, covered up the whole yard. It was a huge, huge, huge tree. So we always had birds and nests in it. Well, in Phoenix, we used to have some really bad storms. Rain and wind and dust, and we'd have some really bad storms there sometimes. Well, my parents were gone. My parents were always going to church or prayer meetings or something, and so um, us, we kids, us kids, us and <laughs> we were home alone, the four of us. I'm the oldest. Probably the next day, I don't know if it was the not that night after the storm, I don't remember the details of it, but at some point I went outside to the front yard and I found this baby, little tiny baby sparrow, no feathers, it was just skin, little tiny baby sparrow on the ground and he was still alive. It was still alive, I don't know if it was a he or a she, a man or a woman. Um, but I picked up this little sparrow and I brought it in the house and I put it probably in a little box with a towel or whatever and um, somebody told me that you need to take bread and wet it and roll it up in little balls and put it in the sparrow's mouth to feed it and, and get an eyedropper and drop water in its mouth. And so I nursed this little baby sparrow and my mom and my dad let me have it. And I named the bird Tweety. And I kept that bird till he was completely full grown. And he was flying all over the house. <laughs> We were doing the dishes, we didn't have a dishwasher then, and the kitchen sink was full of soapy water, and we had just put it in there so all the soap suds were real high, you know. I went out there, and that bird was floating in the coffee pot on top of all those suds. It had soap suds all over it. It was so stinking cute. So I had to rescue him from the soap suds. So anyway, my parents said, that sparrow's grown up, you need to let him go. You need to let him go back outside where he's supposed to be, and you need to quit keeping him. So I said, okay, fine. So I took him outside and I let him go and he flew up into the tree that he had fallen out of when he was a baby. But when I would go outside to play with my friends, we would be out on the driveway playing with the ball. We used to play this thing with this ball where you bounced it in the four squares. I don't know what it was called. We used to play Monopoly out there. And we, you know, back then there wasn't computers and we played outside a lot. Well, we'd be playing, all of a sudden that bird would fly down and just sit on my shoulder. And I used to walk to school. Our school was, I don't know, half a mile away, and we had to walk to the school and walk back because the bus didn't come to our house. And I'd be walking to school with my friends, or we'd get, we would have gotten out of school and we'd be walking home, and the bird would fly down and land on my shoulder. So it was really, really cool. I loved that bird. Oh, I loved that bird. And I was so proud that I had my pet bird flying around all over and, and still loved me and still knew who I was. Out of a crowd of people, he knew who I was. How is that possible? That's God. That's our God. His eye is on this barrel. And so, one time, this sad ending, it still breaks my heart, but um, I had him back in the house. I shouldn't have. But of course, he wanted to come in the house. He wanted to be in the house. That's where he grew up. And so, you know, I'd just walk in the house with him on my shoulder. And I had a bedroom of my own. Well, the bird used to fly up on the curtain rod. And he used to just stand there. Tweety did. I don't know if it was a he or she, but the bird would stand up on the curtain rod. And, of course, it would do its business up there all day long. But what they do is just like a little white hard thing to a little droplet. And they're real easy to clean up. But anyway, it was piling up. And my mom and dad said, get that bird out of this house. He needs to be outside where he belongs. Well, so I thought, well, I can't get him. He's over in the windowsill. And so I, sh I went up with something and I chased him off the, the, um, the rod. And he flew over to this board. My dad used to have this board. It was a real big board. It was like, it was like a door. So it was like a door. It was that size. And it was leaning up against the wall in my bedroom because that's, my dad would come in there to use it. And what he did was called a slant board, and he would put it up on some blocks, and he would lay on it upside down, and it would stretch his back or something. So anyway, that board was in there. Well, so this big board is leaning up against the wall, and my bird got up there and wouldn't come down. 
So I took the board, which of course is big, like this, about <laughs> this big, and I started shaking it like this, so Tweety would fly off of it and I could catch him. He knew I was getting ready to put him outside. Anyway, he slipped behind the board and I hit him with the board accidentally. And think of the board as being as big as a door. And it killed him. It almost killed me. I didn't think I'd ever, ever, ever get over it. It was really, really sad. I felt like the most horrible, horrible person on the planet. My mom and dad tried to console me. I was unconsolable. <laughs> so anyway, I'm sure I gave that bird a proper burial. And, and he's forgiven me by now. But, oh, the things you go through when you're a child, huh? Yeah, I don't know how old I was. I was probably 10, 11, you know, around that age, 10, 11, 12. Okay, my friends, that's my really sweet and really sad sparrow story. <laughs> so, I've got to go now. If I've said anything that you don't agree with or that you don't like, just don't agree with it and don't like it. Don't get mad at me because I'm only telling you how I feel and how I think. And if you don't think that way, I still love you. Okay? I'll be back tomorrow. Bye for now.